On this little blue-green marble we call Earth, there is a distinctly little troubled corner north of the USA, east of the continent of North America, and jutting out from the landmass into the ocean, an island all but for a tiny isthmus of land that connects it to the continent nearby. A place which sometimes feels like it's right out of the twilight zone, because ethics and morals don't work here, apparently, as they do elsewhere. It is a strange place where organizations that do not exist launch expensive and aggressive ad campaigns and somehow find the money, time, and resources to do so. It is a place where time seems to run in reverse, for these organizations only come into being after they have gotten to work, after they have begun running their ad campaigns. It is a place where governments and justice seem to mean something other than they mean elsewhere in the world for neither has found it fit to investigate the political activities of this organization which heretofore did not exist, until it was revealed that it didn't, and then suddenly it popped into being. This bewildering place is called Nova Scotia. Of course, as we learned in a previous episode, The Lies of Forest Nova Scotia, this mysterious organization about which I obviously speak is the Concerned Private Landowner Coalition, an organization that was made up by Forest Nova Scotia, an industry representative and lobbying group, which pretended to represent ordinary land and forest owners throughout the province of Nova Scotia, with the specific goal of stirring up fear about Bill 4, the Biodiversity Act. From the first day its ads hit the news, Forest Nova Scotia has run an intense and expensive media campaign against the Biodiversity Act. From the perspective of its interests and goals, this makes perfect sense. The Biodiversity Act is meant to create standards across both Crown and private land to protect regions with endangered species. The Biodiversity Act put teeth back into environmental regulation, creating stiff penalties for individuals and companies that cause damage in sensitive areas. And it added clause too, by providing provisions whereby companies could not get out of trouble by arguing that they were not responsible for the actions of their employees. Thus, if employees were sent to cut in a sensitive area and ignored boundaries, did not protect water courses, or in some other way degraded the environment, the company that hired them would be held responsible for their employees' actions. This would work against the common big corporate tactic of arguing that they were not responsible for the actions of the individuals under their aegis. And the Biodiversity Act would have provided a legislative push toward conservation and environmental responsibility and some meaningful consequences for those persons who worked against it or simply did not care. It would have meant, ideally, that big industry operators, the pulp cartel, such as Westfor, would have to be much more careful on the lands on which it operated. And from the perspective of the pulp cartel and its lackey, Forest Nova Scotia, this would have set a legal precedent that simply could not be tolerated. So, an extraordinarily expensive ad campaign was immediately pushed and run all throughout Nova Scotia. It has appeared as full-page ads in the Chronicle Herald, Nova Scotia's largest newspaper. The ad campaign pops up frequently in online websites and possibly social media, and people all around the province are hearing ads from this heretofore fictitious group appear on their local radio stations, and all those ads decry loud and clear the horrors of what life will be in Nova Scotia if the Biodiversity Act is passed. Now, ad campaigns are expensive. For example, that full-page, full-color ad that appeared on March 13th in the Chronicle Herald wasn't any nickel and dime piece of propaganda. In fact, if you go to the Chronicle Herald's website into the section that relates costs for would-be advertisers, you will find here, under the print and digital rate card, all the way in the far right column, a notation that a one-day, full-color, full-page ad in the Chronicle Herald cost $7,148. And over the past week, I've been looking up the cost of advertising with radio stations all around the province, depending on whether they are rural or urban, and in general, the estimated size of their audience, as well as the length of an ad. Ad campaigns can cost between $300 and $1,200 a week to run per station. And these campaigns are being run with local radio stations from one side of the province to the other. It is very hard to estimate how much a social media campaign costs because advertisers such as YouTube and Facebook offer pay-by-the-hit options. So a would-be advertiser can establish a budget and run their ad on such social media until the budget has been maxed out. However, having put together the data available, 
It seems likely that Forest Nova Scotia has allocated at least $25,000 toward their advertising campaign. And if it continues all the way until the Biodiversity Act is acted upon, it will be much more. Much, much more. So the question arises, who is behind this campaign against the Biodiversity Act? Who is aiding Forest Nova Scotia? Well, the answer is, you are. If one turns to the notices.novascotia.ca website, one can find the grants and supports paid out to many Nova Scotian organizations. In the document called Public Accounts, Volume 3, Supplementary Information, dating for the fiscal year ended March 31st, 2020. Where, on page 234, one can see that Forest Nova Scotia received taxpayer-funded grants in the amount of $1,220,000. That's a lot of money, in addition to whatever other funds Forest Nova Scotia might receive, that can be applied in any number of directions, including a very costly and extensive and thorough propaganda campaign. And propaganda for the forestry cartel is ultimately what Forest Nova Scotia is all about. But, as my psychology professor used to say, but wait, there's more. Forest Nova Scotia has a lot of friends that also receive big money in the form of taxpayer-provided funds. Let's have a look. Among those friends and allies are J.D. Irving, which received almost $89,000, and Northern Pulp, to the tune of $558,447.61. Port Hawkesbury Paper, which received $4,210,092.66 in funds. And even Herbert C. Haynes, H.C. Haynes, the largest timber broker in Nova Scotia, which received a smallish amount, $6,100 in funds. Now at this point, there is no way to prove that these other organizations, these businesses, played any part directly or indirectly in Forest Nova Scotia's advertisement campaign. And I use the words here, advertisement campaign, very loosely. Because advertisements have truth in advertising standards, whereas Forest Nova Scotia's campaign much more clearly falls under the prerogative of propaganda. As we've covered in previous episodes, it's basically been a lot of intentional and divisive fear-mongering, trying to divide rural versus urban Nova Scotians, and directly aiming to misrepresent the Biodiversity Act as an attack on the rights of private landowners. When, insofar as the Biodiversity Act involved private landowners, its real goal was to set up cooperation between private forest owners to preserve Nova Scotia's endangered flora and fauna. But I think it's especially important to note that between the various pulp cartel interests throughout the province, they had access to taxpayer-provided funds amounting to $6,083,520. And whether those funds went to some private interests such as improving forestry roads or equipment, or conducting repairs, in one way or another, those funds also freed up other funds for a massive and very expensive advertising campaign. In effect, what we have here is a situation in which more than 50% of the funds paid out by the Department of Lands and Forestry, taxpayer-provided funds, have gone to pulp cartel interests, and in one way or another made possible a massive disinformation campaign by Forest Nova Scotia, on behalf of the pulp cartel industries that it represents. By way of comparison, let's look at just how much in the way of funds the Department of Lands and Forestry has allocated to conservation organizations in the province. The very organizations often stuck with the job of trying to keep our ecosystems working and endangered species protected, despite the partial cut treatments, clear cutting, and glyphosate spraying conducted by the pulp cartel. Grants were given out by the Department of Lands and Forestry to Atlantic Canada Conservation Data Center, $23,951.87. Bird Studies Canada, $29,901.00. The Canadian Cooperative Wildlife Center, $9,500. Clean Annapolis River Project, $18,307.53. Ducks Unlimited Canada, $32,000. The Mercy Tobiatic Research Institute Cooperative Limited in the amount of $84,582.84 and Novacila Wildlife Consulting Incorporated to the tune of $20,000 and the Romalina Institute for $13,617. All of this combined means that the Department of Lands and Forestry applied your tax dollars to pay for a paltry $213,552.71 for conservation efforts. 
In other words, the Department of Lands and Forestry gave out almost 29 times more funding to pulp and timber industries around the province than they actually gave to conservation. Or put another way, of the roughly $6.3 million distributed between forestry and conservation, over 96% went to the pulp cartel. And all of that is taxpayer-provided funds. This creates an appalling and imbalanced situation where Forestry Nova Scotia, a forestry public relations group now also acting in the role of forestry lobbying, has access to vast funds, some of which provided by the taxpayer, which it can then turn to use for political activism purposes. Whereas the province's own ecology and conservation organizations, actively involved in protecting our ecosystems and endangered species, are having to work with beans and don't even have funding available to try to counter this bizarre and extremely well-funded propaganda campaign in the media. There is, however, some good news, a light at the end of this tunnel, perhaps. Forest Nova Scotia has spent thousands and thousands of dollars, and I guess by the time this is done, it'll be over $100,000, though I have yet to have had time to put all the numbers together, but I will. But despite this massive and expensive ad campaign, Forest Nova Scotia has managed to convince, as of now, 5.47 p.m., March 28, 2021, a grand total of 481 people to like their page. It's not really an impressive number. Now, if any politicians are listening to this, and I sure hope you are, you should note that the conservationists around this province, and there are tens of thousands of us, far more than Forest Nova Scotia's 481 page likers, you should note that we're angry. We have noted how the coward minister Chuck Porter bailed on Jacob Fillmore Chuck couldn't even find the guts to meet with this 25-year-old kid on a hunger strike over his concerns about rampant clear-cutting. We have also noted how you collapse like a house of cards on a windy day to Forest Nova Scotia's singular effort to destroy the Biodiversity Act before it even had a chance. Forest Nova Scotia has only a few hundred supporters, but without the need of an expensive propaganda campaign, our numbers are many, many thousands strong, and we will vote, strategically and decisively. Thank you for your time, everyone. I wish I could be using this program, like so many previous ones, to focus on the wonders and the beauty of the natural world. Though being involved in conservation has made me ever more aware of the need for perpetual vigilance. And presently, the situation in Nova Scotia is so dire between the rampant clear-cutting, the danger that it represents to endangered species such as our mainland moose, and our provincial government's disregard for the concerns of so many Nova Scotians that I feel it's essential to take some time to really cover this issue thoroughly. There's a tremendous amount of back-scratching and behind-the-scenes dealing going on, and Nova Scotians have every reason to be concerned about our government's failure to respond to this crucial environmental issue. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist Program is committed to the reliable coverage of natural science and environmental issues. If you like our program, please take a moment to subscribe and like.